Well, don't be so shy. Come on. Come on. My niece is incredibly shy. She's right off camera. She's sitting right here. And she is does not want to come on and say hello. But she is a darling, a little darling. Her name is Orion. You want to say hi, Orion? Hello? Yalla, come on. Hello. She's not going to do it. She's too shy. Uh, I hope, apologies in advance if the connectivity is a little wonky here. Trying to do the best I can with what I got. And what I got is what I got. And that's all there is to it. Um, I don't know if this is going to be the regularly scheduled time or not. I don't have my glasses. I don't have my glasses. <laughs> okay. Let's do this. <clears throat> um, so today's topic is a very, very interesting one. It has to do with radiation. Uh, and I don't really know how to explain. I guess we should really just dive in, right? Like radiation. This is about radiation poisoning. Radiation is an incredibly insidious, dangerous, scary, real-life thing that really does affect people, really does hurt people. And um, years ago, people, we didn't know it exists, you know? So uh, let's let's just start. Let's just re start reading about it right now. Hold on one second. I'm gonna pull this up. So this is the unbelievably true story of America's radium girls. What is radium exactly? Let's take a look. Let's look it up. Looking up radium here. It's an, it's an element. The chemical element of atomic number eighty eight a rare radioactive metal of alkaline earth series. It was formed, it was formerly used as a source of radiation for radio therapy. And its origin comes from the late 19th century from the Latin radius, radius, ray plus eum. So that's it. And this article is from All That's Interesting. It's by Richard Stockton and checked by John Krasky. I'm assuming that checked means that they they're, they're very diligent about fact checking sort of some stuff to make make sure that oh crap we just lost our we just lost our tab let me get that back it's gonna be difficult apologize for all the background noise I can't control my Israeli family from talking it's their house not mine so okay here we go let's get rid of that now we're going to go for it. <clears throat> yeah, radiation is a thing that scares the bejesus out of me. You know, I watch a lot of horror movies, and I'm not afraid of anything. I'm really not. Even stuff, even the serial killer stuff, which is real life. You know, the things that scare me are the things that could really happen to me in real life. Even the serial killer stuff doesn't scare me. What really scares me is stuff like radiation. Radiation terrifies me. Um the movies that affect me the most, that cut me the deepest, have everything to do with radiation and what happens with radiation. There's my, there's my little niece. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so that's why I wanted to do, and, and, you know, and what's interesting is, I mean, with, without technology, like you don't know that this stuff exists. Like there's this thing in the air, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't touch it, you can't taste it. And yet it is killing you on a DNA level. It's destroying your DNA. Another, one last bit of preamble before we launch into this and get started. I really, this is really important. I don't want to, This we are not exploiting or making light of what really truly happened to these people. These people actually died because of radiation poisoning. And so we treat the subject matter with incredible, uh, I don't know if trepidation is the right word, with incredible seriousness um, because it's not funny. There's nothing funny about this. I think it's just so, it's so disturbing. And what happened to these, these girls is, is so tragic and sad beyond belief. And 
I suppose we know in part what radiation can do to the body, or at least the first glimpses of what radiation can do to the body from stories like this that happened about a hundred years ago. With that, let's dive into the article, shall we? The Unbelievable True Story of America's Radium Girls by Richard Stockton, checked by John Kurowski. While, while the men wore lead aprons to protect themselves from radiation, the women were given nothing. The radium girls were even told to lick their brushes to get a fine point for detailed work. Can you believe that? They're touching their tongues to, to irradiated material. It's insane. They're painting clock, clock faces. In 1917, scores of patriotic young girls counted themselves lucky enough to, land, uh, to have landed work at a large warehouse complex in Orange, New Jersey, because it was really hard to make money back then. It was not easy. Having a good, solid, stable job meant security you know we were just talking about that the other day in the blog you know financial security you know a solid warehouse job leads to financial security back then it's like you know we think about like careers today it's like that's a career that and you know and there's it's good hard honest work but that was like what a career was back then that was not like a you know it's not the way we think about careers today in, in the 21st century, I would suppose. Um, the pay was fantastic, roughly three times the average working girl's wage, and the work was light, literally. The work was light. I, I, this guy's a great writer. The work was light as the main job the young ladies were given. Sorry, I'm not reading this properly. The work was light as the main job the ladies were given was to apply glowing paint to the faces of clocks, instrument gauges, and wristwatches for the United States Radium Company. What's up, Walter White? How are you? We have Walter checking in from New Zealand. Heard about this subject? Shocking. It is, Walter. It truly is. And we're, we're treating it with the utmost seriousness. We're not... This is not about, uh, it's not a, we're not making light of the tragedy that uh, happens to these girls. We are, you know, analyzing the topic though. Tell me, Walter, if you could comment, how is the sound? There's a lot of noise where I'm at. How is the sound quality right now? Do I sound the loudest out of everybody who's talking here? Just let me know. Um, once a thin layer of white paint impregnated with the newly discovered element radium, they had just discovered it, was layered onto the dials, their hands naturally glowed and made it easier to read at night or in a dark trench in Flanders. I think that's in reference to World War I, right? Um, without exception, the radium girl... Blah, blah, Without exception, the radium girls were told the paint was safe to handle. And you know what? Back then in 1917, whether it was safe to handle or not, they didn't know. They were just, they, they just, they just told them whatever they needed to tell them in order for them to, you know, go do their job, and get the, get the job done. Right. Um, with it, without exception, the radium girls were told the paint was safe to handle. And so virtually no precautions were taken while they handled and even ingested countless doses of radioactive poison. Dill Robert says, I sound good. Thank you, Dill Robert. Glad to hear it. Appreciate the feedback. Um, using a new technology. That you sound, your sound is fine. Can hear background noise, but it's not bad. Can you, okay, good. <laughs> good, good, good. The, radi the radium-infused paint was a new invention in 1917. Though Pierre and Mary Curry, Marie Curry had first identified the element in 1898, it wasn't until 1910 that Marie successfully isolated a sample of it to work with. I mean, you hear, I mean, what you're hearing right now is like, it's like we discovered this thing, we can't get access to it, but we're going to at some point and then utilize it. Took them some years, you know. My wife did a lot, Dilbert said, my Dil says, my wife did a lot of reading on this very subject. This is a messed up piece of history. One of many messed up pieces of history, indeed. I agree. Um, 
right away the couple knew their discovery was dangerous that's interesting so they did know it was it was dangerous marie gave herself several unpleasant burns improperly handling radium so it's the type of radioactive stuff where it's gonna give you a burn in some way shape or form Lalatov. um that's that's interesting so it's like they, they did know that there was an element of danger Pierre once said he couldn't bear the thought of sharing a room with even a kilogram of the stuff because it would he was afraid it would blind him and burn off his skin. Jesus Christ. The Curries were working with large quantities of pure radium. So it's like when you discover this thing and it's it burns you and does all this stuff to you, like I guess in the I guess back then it's like you're kind of thinking of it at like fire, right? Like fire can burn you, fire is bright, and fire can be utilized to do all sorts of things without knowing what radiation can really do. They, they can see the tangible danger of radiation, but they don't understand the long-term effects of radiation. It's very interesting. Um, so the Curry's were working with large quantities of pure radium. The conventional wisdom at the time, however, was that a little bit of the stuff was good for human health. What? Um, I mean, when, when we think of radiation, especially today, we look at it, it's almost like, not today, years from now, probably after we're all long and dead, people will look back on radiation and chemo and stuff and think of it as medieval technology. It's medieval technology that we use to help our, you know, to help people, but it harms as much as it helps. How about that? Um, so they thought it was good for human health throughout the early 20th century. Hundreds of thousands of people drank radium infused tonic water, you voluntarily infusing tonic water into radium and drinking it, brushing their teeth with radium toothpaste and wore radium cosmetics that gave their skin a bright, cheery glow. I mean, it's not even like a co it's not even there's no, there's no comedy about this in the sense that like this is like this is real like people are actually putting irradiated things on their skin because it will make their skin glow it's crazy um mixed with the right kind of paint radium would luminesce luminesce after exposure to light so that a watch face painted with the stuff could soak up energy during the day and stay visible all night long it was one of the scientific miracles of a very optimistic age. My Lord. All right, that's page one of six. We'll go to the next page. The dangers of radium. So here's an old-timey, you'll see this on the, on the thumbnail. Here's an old-timey radium. This is what they're talking about, the stuff that you drink. Drives out uric acid. Suffering from too much uric acid and diseases caused by faulty emulation. I'm not going to pronounce all this stuff. Just all this, these, these, these tremors of the body uh, are all quickly relieved in a natural way without drugs or chemicals by our new discovery. The way to make radium water in your own home. So this, this is like a supplement that you put in a water bottle and you let it sit and soak and then it steeps the water in, in radium, I guess. Um, so this is a, a, a riot. A rayode, a little device containing radium to supply 2,700 Mach units of radioactivity in two quarts of water every 24 hours for less than 10 cents a day. The rayode will last a lifetime. Send for free literature. Can you believe that Colorado Radium Products Company? I mean, people... Like people voluntarily are poisoning themselves because I think it's a, I think it's a good idea. That's insane. That is really wacky, wild stuff, truly. Unfortunately, that bright element had a dark side. The only stable isotope of radium is radium-226, which has a half-life of 1,600 years. For as long as it lasts, any sample of radium will emit alpha particles in all directions. And I guess alpha particles are, are bad, bad news. Normally, alpha radiation is harmless in small doses. Countless natural sources of this radiation can be found 
in the average kitchen or bathroom. Even, even nature is full, full of it as the low energy particles have a hard time penetrating even one layer of skin. Outside the body, it's virtually safe. So if you, I guess if you were to inject it, that would not be the case. I do know that bananas, bananas do contain some levels of radiation. Bananas, all bananas are radioactive, if you could believe it. Inside the body, it reeks, it wreaks god awful havoc on the body's tissues. How about that? That's insane. So you out, it, it can't penetrate skin, but if it gets inside the skin, it wreaks havoc on the body's tissues. That warm glow radium puts out is caused by the elements' atoms acting like tiny batteries. Light photons strike the radium atom, bumping its electrons into a higher orbit. After the sun sets and it gets dark, those electrons spontaneously drop into lower orbits, emitting a particle and some photons as they go. Wow. Okay. Okay. Jesus. When radium is placed next to human cells or in the bloodstream, like when it crosses a mucous membrane, such as the gums, it turns into a microscopic machine gun that gets lodged in the body's tissues. This is terrifying. The radium that fi then fires off a uh, uh, sorry, the radium then fires off particle after particle at very close range, eventually mutating and killing the cell the cells around it. Wow. Walter White says, I read that Brazil nuts are also slightly radioactive. Yeah, I, I, I mean, again, lots of, lots of food is. This is terrifying to me, truly. Um, the work of the radium girls. Okay, let's find out what they did. So those are the radium girls. They're sitting at their desk at their cushy factory job where, where life is, is awesome because they have a, a a career, you know, that was a career back then that like, you know, again, I really, you know, I feel like I, I'm, I'm uh, like uh, sort of being dismissive of factory work. I really am not. And I know that like, th that's a job. It's totally a job. I, I'm just, it's just interesting how it, it just, it things have changed is what I mean. Things are changed. It's like in, in those times, it was like to get a job like that is something that you hold on to all like forever, forever and ever and ever uh, until the end. I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> Am I making sense? Am I not making sense? I'm sorry. The men who worked for USRC wore lead aprons to protect themselves from this radiation, which was known to have a cumulative effect, meaning that it builds up over time, right? Hugh Dillon says that this may have ruined bananas for me. And Lord says, so is cat litter. How about that? I, that's insane. That's insane. Um, so, so it had a cumulative effect and they knew about it. So I guess they did, it wasn't like they just didn't know anything. They, they were just super reckless about it. The shop girls were given no protection of any kind and even encouraged to lick their brushes to get the fine point for detail work. The reason the company gave this uh, uh, blah, the reason the company gave for this difference was that the male engineers were handling huge bundles of raw material while the girls were never exposed to more than a small amount at once. Day after day during the war and for many years after, the radium girls painted military and civilian watches and dials, licking their paintbrushes and handling jars of radi radium tink tincture as carelessly as they would handle any paint. Wow. The paint naturally got all over the girls whose clothes and skin would glow when they got home from work. And they probably thought it was hilarious too. You know, or they probably just like, eh, whatever. The girls thought this was great fun. There you go. Sorry, I didn't see that sentence. The girls thought this was great fun, reassured by their supervisors that they were perfectly safe. Some girls even took to wearing their best ball gowns to work on Friday so they would glow at the dance that weekend. Could you imagine trying to get as much paint on your ball gown because you're going out with your hubby or your brother or whoever, your boyfriend, 
and everybody is, has all eyes on you over the weekend because you're 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 literally glowing and s- secretly the there are protons like tiny machine guns wreaking havoc on your cellular tissues and destroying your DNA on a molecular level. Holy shit. Um, that ter- this, this to me, this stuff to me is terrifying. This is what terrifies me. When I watch a movie like Chernobyl, I don't know if anybody saw the mini series for Chernobyl. I was floored. I was riveted and floored and terrified at the thought of like particles shooting through you faster than a machine gun and destroying your body as it shoots you. I mean, it's crazy. Um, Girls painted their nails with radium, sprinkled flakes in their hair, and even applied it to their teeth to give their kiss a pop. (gasps) Jesus. Marie Curry used to carry a lump of radium with her in in her pocket before they knew it was bad. That is insane. I guess that's what... um, Walter, was it Walter who said? No, that was Dill. Dill was the one who said, Walter said that he had read about it, read, uh, heard about the sh- subject, but it was Dill's wife who, who read about it um, to give their kiss a pop. For several years, working at the radium plant was fun and very well paid. So many of the employees encouraged their sisters, nieces, and sister-in-laws to apply. By 1920, several large families were working on the USRC's floor, totaling around 300 girls at the peak of the operations. Uh, Here is the ugly part. We're getting to the health consequences of the radium poisoning. So now look, here's the photos. I mean, this is tragic. There's nothing... You know, uh, this is not about rubbernecking or gawking. This is the this is the consequences of of ignorance. Um, and you know, I mean, on one hand, you can fault you, you really the fault goes with the company, and a little bit of fault maybe goes with the girls, but not much. You know, I mean, you're supposed to be able to trust your employer. If your employer tells you something is safe, then you should be able to believe it's safe. And it's just crazy. Like this here is this is the horrors of capitalism. You know, you hear a lot of people on the right. I don't know if you want to call it the right or the fringe right or whatever right side of things. Um, talk about how the the dangers and the terror of communism. But here, right here, represented for us right now, these photos represent the danger of capitalism. And I think capitalism is a great thing. But here's the thing about capitalism. What's up, crazy white boy? How you doing? The thing about capitalism is this. Capitalism is a perfect machine that is meant to, that, that is in service to one thing and one thing only, making money. It doesn't care about human life. It doesn't care about anything else. It doesn't, it's not looking to necessarily harm anything else. It's indiscriminate. The only thing that capitalism cares about is making money and whoever or whatever gets in the way of that making money or at the expense of that thing, as long as the money is being made, capitalism is good and will grow. I believe in capitalism. I think capitalism, when regulated and checked, is an incredible thing. I simply just want to point out that capitalism unchecked, you know, where greed and when people stop caring about human life, you have stuff like this happens. And that's what these poor girls suffered from, truthfully. That's the truth, you know. Uh, Lord says, this shows how much the company cares about you. And the Soviet disasters were far worse. Yes, this is true. For anybody who's never seen Chipotle, uh, Chernobyl, it is, I was about to say Chipotle. <laughs> I'm sorry, nervous laugh. Um, Chernobyl was a, a billion times worse, and the negligence there was a billion times worse. Um, but listen, it's not about comparing which one is worse and which one is better. They're both, I mean, they're all bad. It's all bad, you know? It's all bad. It's terrible stuff. So this is what's known as radium jaw a condition in which abscesses grow completely unchecked across the lower face. 
by this point in exposure, the victim is almost certainly dying. So once you reach, once you reach the radium jaw stage, there is no turning back. That is the end of you, most likely. Um, yes, Chipotle does can lead to disaster as well. Taco Bell really leads to disaster. When speaking about capitalism and disaster, there's <laughs> I think Taco Bell takes the cake too, right? Little bit. Uh, in January of 1922, radium girl Molly Magia got a toothache. She went to the dentist. This is freaking me out. Holy crap. This is like we're, it's like we're reading a, a horror story, a ghost story. This really happened to an actual person. She went to the dentist who told her that her molar needed to come out. A few weeks later, she was back to have uh, that one pulled. So her teeth were falling out. Neither would uh, neither wound heal. The, the wounds were not healing, but they grew together and seeped blood and pus into Molly's mouth. More teeth had come out after that. I am, I am absolutely frozen with fear right now. Reading this, by May, her dentist thought that Molly needed surgery to move, remove a fast-growing abscess he found on her jaw. When he got the gums open, the bone didn't look right as it was too ashy and gray. So he gently prodded it with his finger and to his shock and horror, the whole bone crumbled under his fingertip like ashes in a fireplace. Um, excuse me while I faint. Okay, a quick, quick pause there for a moment to acknowledge the absolute terrifying truth of radiation and ra what radiation does to the body further and just think about this for a moment at the height of world war ii the the war the the germans have already surrendered right like forget about whether it was necessary or not forget about forget about the 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 need or the unneed to sacrifice lives over a hundred thousand lives to end one of the worst wars that we've ever experienced. And just think about this casual civilians that are not necessarily at war with America, like their countries at war with America. Maybe they're happy that, that the allies are losing or whatever, you know what I mean? But like, they're just people. They're just civilians living in their country. And their country is doing whatever their country is going to do. It's not like they're going to stop it. Um, all of a sudden, like, they look up in the sky and a, this bomb come, is coming plump, barreling towards them. And the next thing they know is nothing. Because literally, in a split second, they just don't exist. Vaporized. They just disappear off the face of the planet. The people who are farther out are not as lucky, and all of them get plagued with various stuff like this. Did you hear what I just said about the disintegration of bones because of radiation? I just, it, oh my God. Whew. I mean, you know, when people talk about the dangers of what? You know, of, of everything, like, I mean, just remember, we dropped, America dropped bombs full of nuclear megatons or whatever on civilian populations. Even though it was wartime, dropped civilian bombs like that. It's kind of insane. Kind of makes you, kind of makes you recontextualize when, when America, like, um, or people in America criticize other, what happens in other countries. It's interesting. Because it's like, hey, last time I checked, your country dropped a, a the fat boy on, you know, Japan. Sorry, that was such a tangent. So her whole bone, the bone crumbled under his fingertip like ashes in a fireplace. Instead of removing a tumor, he wound up digging Molly's entire left jaw out with nothing but his fingers. He used his fingers to remove her jaw. Unbeknownst to him, the radium had perforated the bone cells and stripped them of calcium. It had like a little machine gun, shredded the collagen inside the bone and left it 
as little more than a pile of splinters. That summer, the rest of Molly's jaw came out, followed by pit bits of her inner ear. Oh, my fucking Lord. Oh, my Lord. By September of 1922, eight months after her first toothache, Molly Maggia was dead. The tumors had cut into her jugular vein and flooded her throat with blood, choking her to death in bed from radium. Molly wasn't the only girl this happened to. Radium passes easily through the gums and into the blood. So around the time that Maggie got sick, all sorts of odd symptoms were cropping up amongst the shop, shop girls. This is like, but this is pure body horror. You couldn't, if you said, hey, write a body horror story for me. There's nothing that you're going to write that's going to be more terrifying or upsetting or disturbing than the real life effects of what radiation will do to the human body. Sorry. One girl suffered a total collapse of her vertebrae as the radiation did to her spine what it had done to Maggie's jaw. Others develop skin cancer, cataracts, throat cancer, and other symptoms of long-term radiation exposure, such as loose teeth and hair loss. At the time, though, radium was known to be acutely dangerous. Nobody had any experience with radiation sickness. Molly's death had been attributed to syphilis, which the company gleefully cited after the accusations and the lawsuits started rolling in. So here's what happens. You have, you have, like, once again, like, we don't care about human life. There is money to be made, and you're not going to take our product off the shelves because, because people are rotting. We don't care. Freaking crazy. Walter White says, I believe that's where the term megadeth comes from, from 10,000 or more people vaporized in the initial flash of a bomb. Holy shit, I had no idea. I really, really did not know that that's where Megadeth comes from. That's insane. Truly insane. Um, okay, next page. Hey, cats! Freaking cats, man. The Radium Girls fight back. So here's a Radium Girl who's sick. Nine of the 14 plaintiffs seeking compensation from the radium dial company for asserted permanent injury suffered as a result of poison poisoning contracted through working paint uh, through work painting radium on watch dials, February 11th, 1938. And roll in the accusations did way back before the USRC had started operations. The firm's president had commissioned safe, safety studies on the glowing muck and had come away satisfied that it was safe. Of course they did. By 1924, when dozens of radium girls were sick or dead, an independent study, one that the, isn't that how it always works? The, co the studies that the companies pay for are always favorable to the companies, but the independent ones are usually the ones that have some, like the real truth to them. This is one that the USRC didn't pay for, established that radioactive paint is indeed hazardous when ingested. Outraged at the implications and the financial ramifications of the study, the USRC did some moder something modern readers are familiar with from dealing with tobacco and big oil companies. They paid for another study that found what they wanted to find, that swallowing radioactive paint is good for you. Could you imagine that? You know, when we look today at like stories like this, all we have to do is look back then, you know, a hundred years ago, you just get another study done and the study, because they're paying the money, the study concludes whatever they want to conclude. And that's uh, concludes whatever you want them to conclude. And then everything's safe and they can go back. And what is this in, in the name of? It's in the name of making a dollar. It's in the name of profit, literally. I mean, we look, you know, the U.S. is in a heat wave right now. Like, you know, it's super hot. It's like, you know, 100 degrees here every day. And it's just like, it's like global warming is real. It's man-made and it's the result of capitalism. It's the result of just greed. But when you really get down to it, we were told 
20, 30 years ago that like we're heating up the planet beyond, you know, sustainability for life on this planet. And it's like, you know, the, there's a documentary, who, what killed the electric car? You know, fossil fuel is what killed the electric car because that's where the money is. What's the, what, what are you going to do with all the money? If, how are you going to spend all your money when you destroy the place in the first, when you destroy the place where we live? You know, like, what are you going to do with all the money? You can't take the money with you when you die. You can't spend the money. You know, if everything's underwater, what are you going to spend the money on? It's just all, bo- it's just so, so ridiculous, man. It's so ridiculous when you think about it. And here's just a, a, a small example of this, of this sort of thing, you know? Um, by 1924, when a dozen, when dozens of radium girls were sick uh, or dead, an independent study, right, one that was not paid for, established that radioactive paint is indeed hazardous when ingested. Outrage at the implications in finance, right, we already, sorry, we did read this, I just went off on a tangent. So they paid for another study and found that the radioactive paint is good for you. None of this would fly after 1925 when Harrison Martland studied the issue for himself. Ooh, that was an accident. Um, Martland would later become the man who coined the term punch drunk to describe the damage boxers had suffered in fights. It's interesting. You don't think about what punch drunk is. The, the, the idea that you could get drunk off of a punch, punch drunk. It's interesting. Um, first, Martland reopened the case of Molly Magia. At the time, Cause of death was established by a coroner's jury, which was made up of laymen and acted like the jury in a court case. It goes without saying that this is a dysfunctional in pathology as it is in criminal justice. So Martland, as medical officer of Essex uh, County, abolished the jury system and hired competent medical examiners. Um. As expected, Molly's corpse showed no sign of syphilis, but had clearly been mangled by radiation. Similar results had come through for the other girls who had died, and eventually the USRC was driven into ruin by the medical and court costs. Good. Good. That's that's a good thing. And it's just kind of crazy how... Oh, it's, it's, so, it's so truly upsetting it's so truly upsetting um some good news and some bad news so here workers at the manhattan project's hartford site putting on protective gear before expo- and that was the thing the company was giving protective gear to some workers men who were handling larger quantities isn't that a shame that these girls potentially the damage might have been mitigated Maybe they still would have been hurt, but the damage would have been mitigated had they been given the protective gear. Um, so they put on protective gear before exposing themselves to alpha-emitting uranium isotopes. Much of the safety protocol for handling radioactive materials was built on scientists' experience with radium exposure. So, so that answers my question. And, you know... When it comes to human tragedy as such, especially, you know, radiation poisoning and radiate, I mean, talk about a painful, truly a painful death. I, I can't think of, I mean, is there any more painful death than radiation poisoning? Um, I mean, maybe I would say it's up there. I would definitely say it's up there. But I guess if there was any sort of bizarre twisted silver lining, it's really not a word that we should be using. We don't want to talk about it like that because it's just, it's an, ultimately it's a tragedy. But if we have to use the word silver lining, did any kind of silver lining come out of this? Did, did anything beneficial come out of these girls' senseless deaths? The only thing is that safety protocol for handling radioactive materials was built on the scientist's experience with radium exposure. So I guess that's the one that doesn't justify it, that doesn't make it okay. But I guess it's the only thing we can take solace in. In a in a senseless situation, we take solace in that. Maybe you think I'm being super heavy-handed with like the way that I'm treating this material. Fine. For me, it like 
I feel great empathy for these people. I really do. It really bums me out. I think it's fascinating and I think it's interesting. I think it makes great content for the channel, but I do, but it does, it does bum me out if, I, if I'm being honest. Um, vindication came too late for most of the radium girls. Many died young, usually in horrible pain and fear, while others lived many years with weakened bones, lost teeth, and various forms of cancer, which may or may not have been caused by their exposure exposure to radium as teens. After a typically protracted and ugly court battle, some of the girls were compensated. Others weren't. There were some girls who weren't even compensated. And life went on. Maribel Williams of Olympia, Washington, may now be the last surviving radium girl. Oh, my God. In 2015, she was 100 and four years old and had worked for the USRC at 16. So one of the radium girls lived all the way to 2015. Wow. I, I don't know when this article was written, but she's still alive. Or at least at the time of this writing, she was still alive. Their sacrifice wasn't in vain. Dr. Marlin's work had attracted attention. And in the 1930s, several research institute, institutes approached him for advice and safety handling even more dicey elements such as uranium and plutonium because they're getting ready to build big bombs. In 1942, physicists at the University of Chicago successfully established a brief chain reaction. Three years later, the Manhattan Project produced several atomic bombs. For decades afterwards, the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission credited the research and experience gained in the USRC shop with helping them devise handling and safety protocols that kept thousands of other young war, war workers safe during World War II. I mean, again, of, of solace in senseless death. The closest thing we can get to solace in such senseless, tragic, ugly, grotesque death. Even today, Dr. Martland's work on the radium girls and the effects of long-term alpha exposure is being cited and it's not too far out to say that tens of thousands of people around the world have benefited from what was learned from the radium girls. Well, it's definitely a more uplifting way to, you know, end, end this article, you know, but, oh my God, it just, it just bums me out. There's a movie. If you want to watch a movie that really like deals with this stuff and talks about this stuff, by the way, if you're new here, please like, share, subscribe leave a comment check out the patreon all sorts of stuff my dad um walter white says my dad used to be an industrial radiographer and he carried an isotope around in a special container workers used to run when he'd turn up but it was safe interesting i guess that was like a lead container or something um if you want to watch a movie about the real like crazy like dangerous again going back to what i was saying about like hiroshima and like what happened in japan um what if you really want to see what it looked like on any kind of realistic level you need to watch a movie called threads it was a made for tv uh, bbc film uh docudrama and it was the script was it's totally a fictional script but it's written it's written um based on reports from commissions that were put together in the 80s at the height of the Cold War to determine what would happen if there was a nuclear exchange. And so it's hyper-realistic. It's hyper-realistic based on scientific speculation and research, based on what happened in Hiroshima, based on all that stuff. And it is gru it's brutal. It's grueling. It's brutal. It's uh, it, it guts you. It really does. It gutted me. I didn't think I would have such a, a, a harsh, harsh reaction. Um, and it really, it really got to me. So check it out if you want to not feel good. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That was excellent. Mad Scary 2, way better than The Day After Tomorrow. Uh, you're referring to Threads, I assume. Yeah, The Day After Tomorrow was Hollywood. This was Threads is real. And if you want to watch another movie like Threads that's a little bit more dramatized, check out The Divide. Uh, it came out in 2011. We actually did a whole podcast about it. It's on this channel. 
uh, I would say that the divide is almost like it's almost like rent. I was calling it the anti-rent for a long time. It's basically like rent, except after <laughs> it's like rent meets friends in the apocalypse, post post-apocalyptic New York City, basically. Missiles hit Manhattan and survivors hide in the basement of this building and they're all dying from radiation poisoning. Spoilers. And it's just brutal and bleak and nihilistic. And um, it's literally like rent. <laughs> like everybody's like doomed. Um, I, I think rent is more uplifting than, than the divide. Uh, so yeah, there's that. But um, yeah, so I've called a lot of content like this. Uh, I saved it. I banked it. I have it all saved up. I've had it saved up. I had a list on my Google Docs, uh, just various articles that I've come across. The next one we're going to do, I think, maybe will be, um, uh, it's, about, it's about The Rock, the movie The Rock, starring Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery, like a listicle sort of thing. But if you like this kind of content, please let me know in the comments. Please let me know if there's something that you want to see discussed. I think this live stream went very, very well. I was very surprised. I thought that the Wi-Fi would be a problem. It doesn't seem to be as problematic as I thought. And I'll definitely be, well, I got to. I don't have a choice, guys. I don't have a choice. I'm flying without a net. So again, if you do, if you watch all the shows and enjoy this stuff, please consider joining the Patreon or um, uh, checking out the Ko-Fi or or anything, or just letting the the ads, the ads play. That's good too. I'm going to, I'm going to actually play us out with the, um, whatchamacallit. Let me see if I can find it here. I'm going to play us out with the Patreon. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So if it'll let me. Hey guys, what's going on? Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've than I thought. It's not working. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full-time. I want this to be my full-time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it gonna be successful? I don't know, but I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full-time, uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. (laughs) So right now I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee. But it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6.66. And- oh. <laughs> The YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind-the-scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just want to thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes. That's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you!
at least.